give everybody a few more minutes to come in and then we'll get started. Thank you guys for uh, braving the snow and, and coming out. I know that uh, we lost some folks who texted early and, uh, and emailed and asked if we were going to cancel and I said no, I felt this was important enough. I would rather do it twice than to cancel and um, have, to, uh, have to reschedule for everybody. Um, because I, I know we made promises to everybody here that we would be here. So um, thank you for uh, for coming out. I know the main roads weren't incredibly horrible, but uh, I'm sure side roads, at least mine was, uh, not not exactly plowed yet. But we do live in northern Illinois, right? So <laughs> I think we have most folks in. Um, Doug, would you mind coming up, please? So we're going to start today out with, uh, with an invocation by uh, Pastor Doug Thiessen, who is here with Heartland. Um, and then after that, we are going to go ahead and do a Pledge of Allegiance. So that way we, we keep consistent with meetings. So, All right, Doug. very good. Well, uh, glad to be able to host this event. You guys are, you are hardy, hardy Midwesterners <laughs> coming out on a morning like this. This is awesome. Uh, would you mind standing? And uh, I'd just be glad to offer a prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, you're looking down, you see this room, uh, some folks in this room who have a real heart for this city and really want the best for our community and the people in our community. And, uh, you know, it just makes me think that um, I, I know that you have even a greater heart for our community and for the people in this community. So my prayer for this morning is that um, there would be great conversation and that um, there would be uh, a wonderful exchange of ideas and that you um, would grow our hearts of compassion and understanding and uh, desire to work together to make uh, our community a wonderful place for everyone to live. And I pray uh, this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And would you join me in pledging allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks. You can take a seat. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask um, Mark Baldwin to come up. It was important that as we move forward, and, and I know if we look backwards, we all have challenge with... Uh, with the amount of meetings and, and locations of meetings and dialogue around this uh, subject of affordable housing and what RHA is, is working to do. Um, but, you know, in the last couple of weeks, I've seen the, the tenor of that discussion change, and, and I do believe um, Mark was instrumental in, in helping that happen. So um, I'd like to ask Mark Baldwin to come up and, and help us frame today's discussion when we get to our discussionary points. All right, thank you very much. Um, I know it's church, and I know in my church there's a tendency to maybe sit way toward the back, but it's a pretty intimate gathering today. I mean, we really are a, a select, brave, hearty group, so I'd encourage you, in the interest of sort of creating a more intimate dialogue, to come to, to, to move forward, if you will. Um, are you trying to set an example, or you, did you arrive late? I don't know, but okay. Um, <laughs> But anyhow, um, it's good to be with you. Um, as some of you are aware, the uh, Register Star last week conducted two nights of community dialogue on the housing issue. I, I didn't realize at the time that we may have created a cottage industry for ourselves. Um, last week, I introduced a framework to ensure that the discussion would be productive. And much of what I said then applies this morning, too. Think of this morning's session as a fact-finding mission, if you will. It's not a debate. It's not a problem-solving session. We're not going to emerge with answers to Rockford's housing challenges. But that's but not really the point in any event. Instead, the, atten the intent is to list elicit answers to your questions, to correct any misinformation, to fill in any gaps in knowledge about this issue and perhaps to demonstrate that we can empathize with people with whom we disagree. Finally, there are some ground rules. Think of these as what separates authentic dialogue from its lesser cousins. First of all, let's resolve to be respectful. Our presenters are here because they've heeded the community's desire for more information, 
They're here because they respect your opinions, because they respect you. Please remember that when the time comes for comments or questions. And about those questions, the goal is to bring clarity to an issue, housing, that is steeped in bureaucratic jargon and overlain with layer upon layer of regulation. So it's entirely likely that the most important question that can be asked is, what do you mean? Or what does that mean? As moderator, if I don't understand something, I may inject that question myself. Finally, there's the issue of tone. We're here to engage in information sharing, dialogue, if you will. And dialogue assumes that people on both sides of a challenging issue approach the topic in good faith. That being the case, dialogue demands that the participants regard one another with respect and assume that people whose views differ from one's own come by their opinions honestly and out of, not out of any malicious intent. So too, dialogue isn't a process of simply waiting your turn to speak. Dialogue requires active listening and an acknowledgement that there are other legitimate points of view. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Ron. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Um, I do want to take this, this opportunity to uh, thank a few folks for coming out. Um, again, in, in spite of the weather, um, we, uh, we have an intimate crowd, or because of the weather, I should say. But in spite of that, folks who made an, an extra effort to come out. And first, uh, I need to start by um, really recognizing two of our Rockford Housing Authority board members. So if I could, Jerry and Phyllis, would you please stand? And I have Jerry Lumpkins, who is the chairman of the RHA Board of Commissioners, Phyllis Genestra, who is the vice chairman of the Board of Commissioners. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to make sure that we recognize our alderman, and, and I did tell Alderman Chiarelli that I, I would make a statement on his behalf today for the alderman. Um, there was some concern uh, by the city on, on how they would be able to participate with a, a pending plat discussion um, that will be had in, a, in an upcoming committee meeting and some concern about the legalities around dialogue in a public setting. Is that a fair statement? So they were, our aldermen were advised that they really can listen, um, but uh, the portion at the end where Alderman Chiarelli was going to speak, he is going to be unable to do that. So I don't want anybody to think he's here not representing, and the same thing with Alderman Odo, and I believe I saw Alderman Beach in the back. Um, do we have any other aldermen who came in? Okay, so first of all, thank you to the aldermen for coming. Second of all, I want to make sure that if you're in their wards, that they are not here silent because they're not here not representing you, but they also need to make sure that they are true to their work and their job and respect, respect those rules of the city. So um, please, if, if there are questions you have, you know, I would be happy to answer whatever I could when we get to that point. So thank you. So I, I really struggled with this presentation, um, put it together, you know, Late last night, I, I looked at how I was going to address the issue of housing and, and where we got our authority and, and how it all comes together. And I was going to bring up some of the past presentations we've done. And then I look on you know, social media and, and other informational exchanges, and, and what I find is I, I think for those who've heard it, they're tired of hearing it, right? So I think the best thing I can do for you is not talk to you about the history of RHA and the fact that we uh, we're born in 1951 out of city council action and, and our bylaws were created by the city. I'm not going to tell you about the type of housing we, we really um, provide for people. That stuff is out there in the lobby and as we break you can, you can look at that. There's booklets out there that share all this information. I'm just going to ask you to look at that. I'm not going to talk to you about our five-year strategic plan or the goals and strategies we put in place in 2013 after a year-long um, analysis of our situations. That's in that book too. You're more than um, able to read all of that on your own. I'm not going to talk to you about the guiding documents and, and the hierarchy of, of government bureaucracy because I think as our aldermen know and, and those who work within city government and county government and federal government know um, it's a bureaucratic mess. And actually when I came to the Housing Authority from the private sector that was one of the things I was hopeful we could change. And over time, I hope we still can continue. We have further guiding documents, which are our city's documents, the Consolidated Plan, Comprehensive Plan. I'm not going to talk to you about that. 
I'm not going to talk to you about the authority that is in all of our documents that, that tell us about opportunity areas, because frankly, you've heard that, right? You've seen it. The discussion has been there. It's been in the, it's been in the news. It's been in the media. And um, my understanding is you really want to know what the heck we're doing, right? Why do we, why do we want to address housing? And so I finished the presentation about 12.30 this morning. I woke up at 5.30 this morning and I said, it's all wrong. So you have the hottest, most uh, off the press version. I want to talk to you about kindergartners missing school. We started looking at the challenges of the housing authority and the folks we serve. And we did it in an evidence-based practice approach. And this is the approach we bring to all of our our efforts, whether it's service delivery or it's housing delivery or neighborhood development. And if you look at this, um, kindergartners not going to school, we know that if they don't show up later in life, they're going to be a problem, right? They're going to be a problem for themselves, their family, and our community because they're not going to achieve the education that, that we need them to achieve, right? To be productive citizens. So why do kindergartners miss school? Anybody have any ideas? Um, we had this discussion in a, uh, in a human services meeting. Uh, Jerry and I were at, um, Commissioner Lumpkins and I were at last weekend for a CEO board chair retreat, and they had this conversation. Everybody thinks that it's the parents' fault, right? The parents are lazy, the parents don't get up in time. It clearly can't be a five or six year old child's problem. It's got to be the parents' problem, right? Well, on the surface, I think we all could probably say, yeah, that, that's what it looks like. But if we start to analyze data, and I had this conversation with my staff yesterday about data, um, I like data because it helps me make good decisions. It helps me provide the uh, direction to the agency that the board wants and uh, has approved. So what we found is um, folks who live in poverty have an incredible amount of disadvantage, including physical and mental health, right? So if we look at that, we start to look at the data, we know that in an unhealthy home, we have an issue with allergies and asthma. And so what we found, and this wasn't just the RHA, at the time we started to analyze this through the Choice Neighborhoods Program, what we found through the partners, which included the Health Department, the YMCA, the United Way, and others, is that many of our kids through Medicaid data actually spent a good part of the night in the hospital for asthma-related problems, allergy-related problems. So it wasn't that they didn't get up in the morning, it's that's about the time they were finally going to sleep when they were discharged. So we started to look at this healthy homes concept because what we knew is kids with special health care needs and they're predominant in low income housing um, and low income houses in low income neighborhoods, that there are 14% of these kids are gonna miss more school than other children who live in healthy environments. And so we started to look at that to say, is that a possibility in the neighborhood? And what we found is within the public housing, partly, but within the housing in the neighborhood around us, absolutely. We had no control in the neighborhood housing um, to provide a healthy environment. And what we found is there is an incredible amount of lead-based paint issues, asbestos issues, and problems that didn't allow our kids to breathe. And so we thought, well, what can we do about this because it's affecting our schools? So Lewis Lemon is the elementary school that serves K through five in our neighborhood on the, on the west side of town in Ellis Heights. What we know is that there's a 28% student mobility rate. And so out of the 404 um, registered children at that school, 113 of them move in and out throughout the course of the year. And that interruption of moving in and out of the school um, doesn't provide them a positive education experience and actually can put them behind. The additional issues related to lead-based paint poisoning, which this neighborhood has the highest um, actually affect their IQ. And so what could we do as a community? And the health department did a great job of going after a lead-based paint grant for remediation, focusing on this and other low-income neighborhoods throughout our city. And over the past, I believe, four years has brought $5 million to our community to address this issue. But at the end of the day, that still doesn't get kids to school, right? So what we know and, and what I started to look at is the school route, and, and this is what all of our other partners looked at too. The state of Illinois, if you live a mile and a half from school, you have to walk unless you have a debilitating disease and you can get SEPTRAN. So what we found is it's 0.8 miles from Fairgrounds to Lewis Lemon School. 
and the route in between, in between was a problem. And, and we'll make this presentation available for everybody afterwards on our website. So this is a problem. This is what our kids walked on, okay? And this is assuming, first of all, they got up and got out the door. And so what we found in our, in our property was that many of our moms actually were leaving the house before the kids had to go to school because they were trying to get on a bus um, to get to work on time, and they were leaving their kids home with siblings or neighbors to get their kids to school. And oftentimes there was a failure in that. But once you got beyond the health issues and you got beyond the, the you know, getting somebody to wake the kids up, you have the route, an unhealthy and dangerous route. So I took these pictures yesterday. The picture on the left is a homeless man coming out of that house that's boarded up. It's a problem in our community, not just in this neighborhood. So I'm not trying to say that Ellis Heights in this area is incredibly disadvantaged because I think what you're going to find your alderman would tell you is that this is all over our city. These are the sidewalks um, that they can't walk on. And again, these were yesterday. And so while we've done an incredible amount of work in this neighborhood as a community, not the housing authority, but as a community to tear down blighted homes, we're not maintaining the vacant lots. And I'm thankful that we do have a representative here of the West Gateway Coalition because I know his team and the neighborhood uh, association members are actually tackling some of these issues in the neighborhood. But even if they get past all of that, um, there are reminders along the way throughout the neighborhood of crime. And so the Housing Authority, a few years back, adopted a healthy homes model. And when we talk about healthy homes, we're not just talking about air quality. We're also talking about the environment in which people live. And so if there's a lot of violence, if there's a lack of education, if there's a lack of health care, if there's a lack of a behavioral and emotional connection to care, then we don't have a healthy, a healthy home for our kids to live in. And if we get them through the sidewalks and the streets and, and all the other things, um, this neighborhood has an incredible number of sexual offenders registered and a great deal that are unregistered. On the other side of that, um, we have a walk from the proposed site at South Newtown to Gregory's School. I think what's important is this Great Schools is an independent rating system, and I didn't, uh, pay it, I didn't uh, point it out in the previous slides, but while Lewis Lemon has had significant changes, and I don't mean any uh, disparaging remarks to the teachers and system there, it has a rating of 1 out of 10, and it's consistently been low performing, whereas Great, uh, great Schools has given the Gregory School a 6 out of 10, which I'm not saying is ac absolutely the most incredible performance, but it's a heck of a lot better environment. And the kids, as they walk, won't have to address all the challenges and issues they do when they come from the current site. We also know that the enrollment at this school is 333, and that it has an 11% mobility rate. So only 33 kids move in and out of the school district on an annual basis, which is an incredible advantage for the kids that we eventually will hopefully be housing on this site. And um, there is just a handful of sexual offenders. I'm not saying that that's okay, right? What I'm saying is there's a difference. So best practice, evidence-based um, investigation led us to Healthy Homes decisions. It addresses at a HUD level multiple um, childhood diseases, but we expanded that to a much broader, um, better evidence-based practice, which is to include the environment uh, that the children live in and ultimately improve that environment so they're not having to deal with these types of issues. Also, this Safe Routes to School was an evidence-based best practice, and uh, it started in the early 70s, looking at how you make sure kids are safe leaving the home and getting to school, and they arrive there in one piece without any damage or danger to them. Our partners were able to do amazing things, and these are actually actual pictures of our walking school bus. It sounds simple, right? Um, coordinate people getting to school, but kids are safer in numbers. And so the YMCA and the United Way and the Health Department did a great job of formulating a Safe Routes to School program um, that is actually the only national daily walking to school, school bus, uh, walking school bus program. Um, now there are over 40 kids a day. They pick them up as they leave fairgrounds. They get to Lewis Lemon, and this year they also get to uh, Ellis Safe. 
and we know that they don't have to worry about the challenges that I know my son walks from my house to his school. He doesn't have the same challenges these kids have. So does it work? Well, we know that it does because kindergarten truancy is down 67% in this neighborhood. When we're able to look at facts, when we're able to look at evidence, and we're able to make decisions based on evidence, we make significant changes in lives. And we use this model, it's an intervention model. Um, you're gonna find that most healthcare industry professionals use the same model. We, uh, we've changed it from health intervention to housing intervention. And I can assure you that my board and um, myself and my team have absolutely no interest in moving fairgrounds from the, east, excuse me, the west side of town to the east side of town. What we want to do is provide opportunity. And what I think we don't all realize is the challenge that they face on a daily basis. So we use this evidence-based practice to develop our housing strategy, which is to transition 1,100 public housing units to a private model. Folks, the public housing system is broken, and I can't debate with any of you the fact that it's a good system, because I don't believe myself that it is. It's subject to annual appropriations, it's subject to political debate, and it doesn't get funded the way it's supposed to. And I also look at it from a fairness basis, right? I know that I pay taxes just like you do, and I don't think we're getting a return on investment for our taxes in the public housing system. So how do we best improve that? And the evidence-based processes is the type of development work we're talking about. So there have been some discussions, and I need to clarify, though, what is affordable housing versus what is public housing? Did you know most people in our city are unable to afford the home that they live in? Well, this is whether you rent it or own it. 50% um, is the number right now of folks who are considered what's called housing burden, mean, meaning more than 30% of your income goes to home and home-related expenses, whether you rent or own. Um, affordable housing simply means that 30% or less of your income is going to go towards those housing expenses. And so when we look at that, that could be or could not be subsidized housing. Okay, it just depends on where you are on the income level versus where your rent is. But affordable housing, you're not gonna pay any more than 30% of your income towards rent. On public housing, this is property that we as a housing authority own, the federal government subsidizes. Uh, we get a, um, a federal subsidy for the rent portion. And while the tenant pays 30% of their income, the ownership structure, in my opinion, is flawed. It, it puts, housing in a structure that is not funded appropriately. So some can look at that and say we've taken poor quality or poor care of our housing and let it go bad, right? But the reality is I started at RHA five years ago doing development work and we got $8 million a year for, at that time we were getting $8 million a year for capital expenditures. This is improvement to the real estate. Right now we're getting $2.9 million. We don't have fewer units. And at the end of the day, our, our real estate has not gotten any younger, it's gotten older. And I think we can all take our own experiences from our home and say as our home gets older, it costs more to operate. So the, the system itself is flawed. The reason I like the system we're moving to is we actually fund reserves ahead of time. So before a shovel is stuck in the ground, we're gonna put money in the bank to ensure that it's always taken care of well. And we've done this with the same approach, evidence-based practices. So some of you have heard me talk about the success of a development like um, what is being proposed is really, really ingrained in the design, the management, and the location. And so through this, um, we know that, uh, that we stand a significant chance of having success if we follow these types of practices, right? The, the unknown is how do we as a community either accept or not accept the folks who are going to be coming as neighbors. And so one of the things, and I don't mean this to rub anybody the wrong way, but the problem is not so much what we don't know, it's what we think we know that just ain't so from Mark Twain. So today for me is an opportunity to get the facts on the table. Um, we're gonna to move towards this, this uh, moderated questions that 
uh, Mark is, is going to work for or work towards. And as I set probably the timing up, and I'm sorry, I don't even know what time it is. I didn't wear a watch today. Is somebody got the time? 9.30, so I'm right on schedule. Awesome. Um, we're going to do this till about 9.45. At 9.45, we're going to go out into the lobby. Um, we have some boards out there with some post-it notes and five questions. We want to know the answers to those questions because today is not the last time we're going to meet, but the, today is just one in a, in a series of many times we're going to meet. And we want to know how do we become better neighbors in this community, not just at Newtown, but all over the community. And those answers you guys give us will help us frame the dialogue for future meetings and the, and the um, smaller roundtable discussions that are, are topic related. So I'm going to ask you after we're done with Q&A in here to go out and put your thoughts on those boards um, throughout the rest of the morning at, uh, at 9.45. Um, that's when we'll break. 10 o'clock we'll come back in and then we'll talk a little bit about um, the rest of the housing plan starting with, uh, with RHA's uh, overall plan and ending with the South Newtown development. So, Mark, I, I know that uh, Adrian's passing out comment cards um, and, or question cards. Anybody have questions that, uh, that you want to bring forward so that uh, Mark can read them out? I know we're having a technical difficulty with getting them read into a teleprompter, but we want to make sure and I will ask at the end of, quest at the end of the Q&A, did we answer all the questions? I don't want anybody to walk out of here feeling their question was unanswered um, or that you know, we, we somehow lost your card. What, is, what impact does public housing have on the value of homes in the surrounding areas? Um, and uh, and I guess I would I would expand a little bit. What impact does public slash affordable housing have on the value of homes in the surrounding areas? Well, this is one of those where it's not exactly a a, a, a cut or dry answer. Um, if it's well run, well managed, well maintained, and and I'm going to go with a broader definition of public housing. This let's just go all su all subsidized. So this could be government-owned project-based Section 8. It could be traditional public housing. Um, it could be you know, uh, Section 221 or, or 803, which serves elderly and disabled. If it's well run, well financed from the beginning, ultimately it actually can help improve the quality of a neighborhood. Unfortunately, I, uh, let, let me just ask you this. Are there, I know you, you, are, uh, uh, you, you like the data, and, and, and we want to be evidence-based. What do the data say? Are there, sure. are there studies that, that support that? There are a number of studies that support this, and, and I think we could bring it back to the gut example we all probably feel. Um, how many folks have gone out to the Hope, site, uh, Hope 6 site on the west side of town? Okay, so for you, um, you've experienced the fact that we had a very troubled neighborhood with very poor quality housing. We tore it down, we built new homes, um, both for rent and for sale. People moved into the neighborhood and there's been significant change in the quality of that neighborhood. But the failure of the Hope 6 program was you now have a quality development, a quality neighborhood that still is within the sea of other challenge, right? So you, you haven't done anything in the surrounding neighborhood and that's why Choice Neighborhoods was fashioned after the purpose-built model um, to address the whole neighborhood, not just the public housing component. Can you give examples of cities where the public housing strategies have worked? Absolutely. Again, it's prefaced on the fact that whoever implemented them did them well. But um, you can see that the, you know, the probably whoop, highest uh, profile is Denver. And uh, I think Denver, um, it's been successful for a, a number of reasons over the past decade, and that is our le the leadership there and had the opportunity to talk with and meet with the mayor, um, the two mayors, uh, the, the current Hancock and the prior, um, they actually made a, a statement as a, as a city that said, we're going to make sure that our working class citizens and our impoverished, impoverished citizens are going to be in high quality places to live to get them out of poverty. So Denver is the one that always comes top of mind. You see pockets in Washington, D.C. 
that work. Um, you see areas, uh, you know, and this is, this is, I don't think, a fair comparison when you look at what happened um, with with storms down in Louisiana, but uh, you know when you when you repurpose and rebuild a whole community, of course it works, right? Um, we're working with challenges that that we don't have that type of funding mechanism. That federal money is not going to come in here, but there are a number of cities. Okay. Um, here's a question from: uh, We live across the street from uh, from your project. Uh, we're adjacent to the RHA land. How is the fair housing law fair to us, the owners of housing we had worked and paid for? Um, good question. And maybe uh, the way to start just is, is with some context. Explain what, fair, what federal fair housing law requires. Sure. Federal fair housing law requires that we not treat people different based on the color of their skin, their sex, their sexual orientation, their religious background, their age, or their um, either able-bodied or disabled status. So we must provide everybody the same treatment no matter what. So um, that was really hatched in the, in the Civil Rights Act and then some fair housing laws that came after it. So as a, as a neighbor, first when you bought your home, um, depending on your status, uh, the bank that gave you the mortgage could not discriminate against you. The city that created laws um, and zoning ordinances could not discriminate, so you couldn't move to that neighborhood. And um, the enforcement all, of all of those was equitable, right? So I understand what people are saying when they're fearful of the imbalance or the unfairness, right? Joe, I'm sorry, there was a gentleman who had a question there. Um, and sometimes it comes across across as seeming unfair. And I understand why people feel that way. The, the way to look at it um, that I think most people, when they feel that way, brings it to a, a logical conclusion is we shouldn't first and foremost discriminate against anybody. And you weren't discriminated for, for coming there. The folks who are, are moving there aren't discriminated against. Is there a challenge with income? Absolutely. And I see where you probably feel your tax dollars are, are not being well spent. But what we know through evidence-based research and proper design and planning and execution on a quality housing platform is folks actually get out of poverty, right? And that's what we want for everybody we know that's, that you know, is, is um, of concern for us as, as family members and, and community members. And we want the same for our folks. Um, that does work. And, and if we can't think about it in the sense that it's you know, illegal to discriminate and it's legal to provide opportunity, then we should think of it, um, some should think of it, simply as a dollars and cents equation. And it's actually cheaper for us as taxpaying citizens to provide this type of opportunity so that people get out of poverty and they're not placed in, in developments like we talked about that provide unhealthy um, access to opportunity. Who profits from the nonprofit organization? And I think uh, you probably want to explain a little bit about how Gorman is structured and and uh, uh, how they will manage and, and where the money is going to sure. go. Sure. So um, this is why it's difficult to talk about because it's a low-income housing tax credit deal and it requires an incredible amount of uh, legal structure. So now, now let me let me just in the interest of clarity. Explain how those tax credits work for, for those okay. of us who are not finance um, So savvy. this project, this development, um, it received $1.2 million in tax credits, which come over a 10-year period. There are private corporations that will buy those tax credits from the not-for-profit partnership, um, public-private partnership. They will buy those on an annual basis. We're able to take that legal obligation between the, the partnership and the, the corporation buying the tax credits and finance that. So over 10 years, we would get $12 million. Time value of money, we bring that down right now to a loan that's a little over $10 million. That annual buying or purchasing of the tax credits allows us to pay the debt service on that loan. Um, it, the reason why I like it is it's not a direct check from the federal government like our, our capital fund is. Um, it encourages businesses to expand and improve and, and they get the credit because they're actually making profit. Um, the corporate world is, and, and employing people, which at the end of the day is, is what we're hopeful for. 
So that's how the tax credit works in a very simple, easy, uh, easy approach. The challenge is, um, if we look at that, you know, I know that, that I don't, and I don't know anybody who does need $1.2 million a year in tax credit, right? This goes against your actual tax obligation, so it's, that's why it needs to go to a corporation. Um, as a not-for-profit arm, Bridge Rockford Alliance is unable to use that and tax just, credit. Can you explain what Bridge Rockford Alliance is? Absolutely. For... Bridge, Bridge Rockford Alliance is um, a not-for-profit we formed, we being RHA, uh, in 2011 uh, because the Housing Authority can only operate and own public housing and operate a Section 8 program. Bridge Rockford allows us to operate and own real estate of any kind. And, um, and that even includes commercial real estate that develops income so we can afford to maintain um, our property and deliver service. So um, we, uh, Mark, there's, Don has a card. So we, we were able to um, form, the, uh, form the not-for-profit. That not-for-profit um, partnered with Gorman, who is a for-profit developer. And I think what, what I would like folks to know most is, is there profit in this deal? Absolutely. Right? Everybody goes to work on a daily basis so their business can make profit for some reason. And in this particular case, why I like this arrangement is there's two forms of profit. There's cash flow from the operation of, of the real estate, which is very slim. Okay, This is not like a market rate deal where you get a ton of cash out of it uh, on an annual basis. Uh, that, that money that is there actually stays with the development. There's what's called a waterfall payout. Um, and how that, that gets paid out to either Gorman or to us on an annual basis if there is profit. The last piece is the developer fees. And the partnership with us, Bridge Rockford and Gorman, allows those developer fees, um, part of those developer fees, to come back into our not-for-profit so we can expand the service delivery and the opportunities for our folks. This is an area where the Housing Authority doesn't have the funding and so, you know, this, this deal actually generates close to $200,000 for this type of work so we could provide better service. I hope I answered that question. It was a lengthy answer, but there were a lot of pieces. Okay. Um, we have, it's, it's right about 945. We got time for maybe one more okay, question, and we'll, one more. So I could just, want, for everybody, okay. since we didn't get through all of them, okay. you will hold on to them, and then we'll okay. do them all okay. at the for, end if that enough. works. I want to make oh. sure everybody has an opportunity to be heard. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. No, well, we can do, let's do one more and then break. One, Sorry. Okay. There are a couple here um, that sort of go in the same air, uh, in the same direction. Um, you know, concerns about uh, crime. Uh, you know, when are you going to talk about all the crime involved in this project? Um, which it should be addressed as it is written in the city chrome, you know, crime and that poverty is the number one protest against this project. Um, there's a, and, and I think related to it is what specific actions is RHA and government able to provide to residents in order to assist and manage their lives in terms of safety, education, jobs, and other good practices in a neighborhood? Those, to me, those questions seem somewhat similar linked. or yeah. related. So crime, um, first of all, we know that that there is more crime, and some of you have heard this, and, and I know that uh, um, we struggle with the belief around this, but there is more crime if we look at the data from the police department around our developments than in our developments. I think a way to, to look at this is people who come to us and apply for housing, um, right now we're denying significant amounts of people housing because they come to us either with a criminal background or they owe people money and you're not able to live with us if either situation exists. So right now that's about 600 people a year who come to us and we say, sorry about your luck, um, you don't qualify. So when they move in with us, they don't have a criminal background. Um, what, we, what we find though is... Can, can, I, let me, can I just, for clarification, does that mean no ex-felons, no ex-offenders? What yeah. about misdemeanors? Um, there could be modest misdemeanors okay. depending on what it is like... Um, you know, we, I know we just did a hearing and, and we actually denied because there was a misdemeanor. This, uh, this uh, young lady had written some bad checks three years ago. Um, we denied based on her, her uh, being arrested and charged for these, but she made restitution. She paid the people who she owed the money to. And so we denied her, but she has the opportunity to come in for a hearing. We sat down through the hearing, we got to the facts and we said, okay, that's not 
like you were carrying around a gun or, or selling drugs. So um, I hope that's a lesson learned and, and we do house. So it does depend. But um, the rules for public housing folks and, and affordable housing is if you are a sexual predator or offender, you're never living with us. You can't, it, it's illegal. Um, if you are involved in drugs or guns and, and violence, you're not living with us either. Those are our rules. So when we deny these 600 folks, what we know by tracking the data is, and, and you know, I've been with the Housing Authority a little over four years total, uh, that's 2,400 folks who are now mostly living around us, right? In poor quality housing by landlords who just look to see if you have a pulse and you're gonna be able to pay that rent. That's where we need to come together on solutions, right? Because I think as a community, when, when they're denied by the housing authority, they don't get on a bus and go somewhere else. They still live here. And as community members, we have to address that because what they do is they create pockets of crime and, and higher poverty that affect the folks that do live with us. Now, I don't want anybody to walk away from here thinking I don't believe we don't have issues with crime on our property because I know we do. Every multifamily property does, every neighborhood does, and we absolutely must address those. And I don't feel comfortable ever telling our residents and, and we can't pound our chest and say, hey, guess what, crime's down 81% in our neighborhood or crime's down 81% in our development when every day you wake up and you walk by those memorials of people who in your neighborhood are no longer with us. That's not acceptable. So we have to address that fact. The other pieces, um, if you look in our, in our public housing plan, in our direction, and in, in the direction the city has given us through its, its most recent 2020 plan, we have to provide housing that gets folks access to education, that provides them access to quality health care, that provides them access to jobs and opportunity for income growth, and, and really provides an opportunity to reduce crime in neighborhoods. Those are all givens, and that has been established in this documentation that we're going to work together as we go forward. Okay. All right. Why don't we break there, and uh, we can, we'll come back with other questions later. I'd appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Um, please make sure you, you put your notes on each of those boards, and I ensure, um, I, I will ensure that anybody who provided a card, we will answer those, and, and I'll make sure at the end, I'll ask you to raise your hand, that your question was heard and answered, um, and then we'll use this to frame future discussions, as I said. Thank you, everybody. Please, uh, please enjoy 15 minutes of me not talking. I think most, um, most, most folks are coming back in while they're, while they're coming in. I've um, been waiting for a text, which I keep my phone back here, so I know, uh, know where our friends from Gorman are. Um, Tom Cap and Jim Bussey, who are coming from Madison. Uh, Jim was not going to make it because of the snow. Um, he's the regional property director, and uh, given the snow in the Midwest, and that's his territory, uh, he was out with his team making sure that everybody's development gets cleared and, and done. Tom Cap, um, who is the, uh, I believe his actual title is CEO, um, is not going to make it. He got stuck on his way from Madison and uh, been waiting for Andre um, to see his progress and he is not going to make it here before our meeting ends. So um, we will do this again. I just don't want you to think that uh, given the snow, we're, we're going to call it a day, but, uh, but we will do this again. So I will cover some of the stuff for Gorman, um, but not probably to the depth that Andre was going to. Um, somebody did ask while we were on break, um, you know, what about this being recorded or, or photography? Um, will it be put out there? And so the answer is yes. Um, in the lobby, there was a sign-in sheet that asked for your information, including your email address. Um, we will work with, with our friends at MMG to get the video and, and the information out, hopefully by midweek, um, so you can go back and direct others to it for discussion. And then again, we'll continue to, to reframe how we do future meetings, including um, one where we'll, we'll definitely have the folks from Gorman here. So a lot of question has come up um, about how did RHA and Gorman come together. Uh, I did tell you I joined the Housing Authority some years ago. I actually joined in November of 2010. Um, I was hired from a private real estate developer, William Charles, here in town. 
to do real estate development for the Housing Authority, and we did the Jane Addams development over at College and Seminary um, in actually 2013, and it is when it was completed. Um, it uh, was fully occupied, I should say, in 2013. It, construction was done in 2012. But these developments do take an inordinate amount of time to put all the moving pieces together. Gorman had already been hired at that point through a master developer request for proposals. A number of developers did apply. Um, some of you who, who are you know, out there on the social media side may have seen this post or may not have. Um, actually, we had six developers who applied, um, but none of them brought what we were looking for. I absolutely believe a developer must also manage, and they must do both of those things well. And not uh, the other participants in that process, let's say, through a scoring process didn't rise as high. I came on um, during the tours, and so uh, we went to other developments that these developers had done, and, and we went into uh, Chicago for one, um, Milwaukee, and Madison for Gorman. Um, and then the others were out of state, so we didn't, we didn't visit those. But what we found is when we spoke with the political leaders in these communities, um, the political leaders in Madison and Milwaukee said that they would invite Gorman back to do more work, which is important to me because that means they delivered on the promises they made. So has this process been a challenge? Absolutely. Has it had some uh, things I'd like to go back and do all over again? Absolutely, most of these do. But at the end of the day, um, the ability to deliver is what's important. And so the master development agreement that RHA has with Gorman on the fairgrounds deal, on the Brewington deal, um, and a couple others you see here in a moment is important to me because it provides that data and delivery points that if they don't perform, then it's a violation of contract and we can address that. So there is an existing contract for master developer. The other piece is that I want you to know that uh, Camiros was the planner. This is Camiros Limited, um, our planners out of the Chicago area. They've done a great deal of work in redeveloping existing low-income neighborhoods and, and helping to make them productive neighborhoods that contribute back to a community, provide opportunity for residents to live there. They've also done a great deal of design work in, um, in cities like ours, in fact, have done a great deal of design work in Rockford. So part of what came out for me the other night in, um, in the roundtables is that there clearly isn't an understanding of, of what we're trying to accomplish with 1,100 units. So I want to talk to you about the development strategy because it actually was hatched before many of the agreements with Gorman were reached. And it's what launched us into going out for an RFP for developers. So the Housing Authority has 1,900 public housing units. And we know that 1,100 of them are not in the condition we want them to be. They don't deliver back to the neighborhood. And financially, they're not as sound and viable as, as I want them to be as the director of this agency. So of those 1,100 units, 480 of them were looking at renovating in place, meaning they're not moving anywhere. Okay? The other 628 we're going to demolish and we're going to build sites or buy existing facilities, meaning homes and, and small multifamily developments, and refurbish them so they contribute back to the quality of the neighborhood and the community. This is important um, to me because at the end of the day, if we're bringing down a development like Brewington, which is 418 units, and folks, I will be the first one to tell you, this place sucks. And I'm sorry, I, I can't say it any other way. I don't feel good going to work every day letting people or making them live here. This development, 418 units, is in the residential area in the Orchid neighborhood on the old site of the Col Rockford College. Um, across the street, we built the Jane Addams development. I intentionally did not put pictures in this presentation for you because I'm not here to sell you anything or make you change your mind on the work we do, but at least give you the data and the facts. So right now, this development we know is going to cost about $68 million to just repurpose and build in place. But it doesn't belong there. It never did. Construction con con uh, concluded in 1969. This building has never been more than 83% occupied. 
as far as I see it as a community, when we agreed to build this in the 60s, we made a mistake. But we've been living with that mistake for decades. And so what we need to do is, is to remove this, uh, this development and look at how we better serve our clients and neighborhoods of opportunity. This development does have 56% disabled uh, populations and 14% senior. Orton Keys, this will be remodeled in site, on site, and um, over the past five years, we've put $4.2 million into this development uh, through a number of different opportunities, energy performance contracting, the America's Recovery Act money, and it is significantly better than it was, but it's not good enough. It's not good enough for our community or the folks who live there. And so we actually have preliminary approval on a $14.5 million upgrade. It's a single phase renovation that will create a mixed income community. Currently there's 20% of disabled folks living here and 11% senior. When we talk about redeveloping 1,100 units, the dialogue the other night was moving 1,100 families. Okay. We're ultimately, at the end of the day, yes, moving 1,100 families, but 400 of them are coming back to where they were before, they start, before we started, right? We have to move them out temporarily to renovate the units and put them back in because you probably have been through you know, your own renovations at home um, or you don't want to live there during that time, but it's going to be quicker, easier, and more economical for us to move them out. But this is disruption to 1,100 families at the end of the day. And while we talk a lot about bricks and mortar, we're always talking about people's lives. And I just don't want us to forget that. The other is scattered site remodel. These are 305 units. Again, in the last five years, we've put close to $2.4 million in these properties. Um, we have a preliminary approval for phase one. Each of these will be done in, in three phases, both east and west of the river. These 300 units are actually equally divided in our community, half east of the river, half west of the river. And through the three phases in each, we will redevelop most of those exactly where they are. But I have to tell you, we have some, and we call them A, B, and C. Um, folks who are living in those Cs, whether you're on the east side of the river or the west side of the river, these are homes that I don't want in your neighborhoods anymore. They don't contribute to the improvement of your neighborhood or the quality of your neighborhood, so they need to go. So the third phase will indeed involve some folks moving but not everybody. Fairgrounds. This is clearly the, uh, the development that has caused the most angst in our community. Um, in the last five years, we put $200,000 into it, mainly just to keep the lights on and, and keep people at least living in a safe environment. And by safe, I mean, you know, the doors aren't falling off the hinges, the windows aren't falling on our kids. We did, win in a, a successful award um, for what's called Rental Assistance Demonstration, or RAD. We're able to take it, it, as well as the other units I just shared with you, out of the public housing world and put them in that public-private partnership. And at the end of the day, um, we call it recapitalize. I like to prefer the term, or prefer the term invest, back into our community. And so this will be done in three phases. The first phase, and this is just concept, so please don't, don't take this as this is exactly what's going to happen, but fairgrounds phase three will be the last one, and some of you have heard us talk about this. It's 60 units back on the existing fairground site. This is turned sideways. I had to get it that way to get it on the screen, um, so I show north as being to the left. It should be facing upwards. School, school Street is on the left, and then Jefferson and State actually would be to the south or at the far right of the screen. This will be a mix of single family um, and townhomes. And the reason we look at single family and townhomes, and there's community buildings in here too, just like we're talking about in other locations, having community buildings. The community buildings are important to deliver services to our folks. And I know that the community feels, our, our general community of Rockford feels that scattered sites are the way to go. And for some, I don't disagree with you at all, right? We'll talk about scattered sites in a moment. I just showed you we own 305, but not everybody is equipped to live in a scattered site. 
So if you think about our own experiences, how many of us started out life uh, either right out of our folks' homes or college or high school or whatever the case may be and had to move to an apartment, right? So many of us did. Many of us didn't go from our parents' homes or grandparents' homes right into single-family ownership or, or single-family rental. And it's because we need to grow, right? We don't know what the heck it means to own a house and take care of a house or even rent a house and take care of a house. So imagine if you're also trying to, at the same time, get your education. You're also trying to improve your employment opportunities and, in some cases, raise children. Let's just be honest, in many cases, raise children, right? So that noise of maintenance of a home is going to fall to the bottom of your list. And we won't put folks in neighborhoods who are unable to take care of that home because I don't want them to be a bad neighbor. Them being a bad neighbor reflects on our work as an agency. Phase two is 106 scattered site units. This is all through Winnebago County. We are currently looking at a number of different units, um, both single family and small multifamily, so duplexes, fourplexes, etc. The reason we're looking at these throughout is I do agree with you that folks need to live in single family housing. I do agree that folks need and want to live in small multifamily. And I do agree that folks need and want to live in other areas of our community. However, I will not aimlessly put housing somewhere, and our city's consolidated plan tells me I can't do it anyway, um, but even if it didn't, I still wouldn't do it, folks. I would not just put housing somewhere else in the community where there is not access to opportunity for our residents. Because at the end of the day, when Fairgrounds was built, 1971, the government came in and said it's a failure in 1971, just like they did with Brewington. And we've been living with the failure of design and location ever since, right? If you don't have access to an education system, transportation system, job system, or healthcare system, you are isolated. And that's what we have right now, and I won't create new isolation, because then what I'm hearing when folks say, you're just creating another project, that's what that would look like. The isolation is what makes a project. The interconnectedness to your community is what makes a neighborhood. So you've probably seen some of these out there, and this is where Andre or Tom was supposed to take the stage and talk to you a little bit about the Newtown property. This is phase one. Um, we don't have a name for it. I'm trying to get away from Newtown because I think that it has enough um, anxiety around it. I was talking to somebody on break about the anxiety in our community and why, when you look around, you see very few of our residents here. Well, one, it was a transportation issue today, but two, um, when we held recent meetings at fairgrounds, people are afraid, right? And I, I think what I found, and in, in, we talked about the Gregory School meeting too, is people were afraid. The commonality that we have amongst ourselves was that fear of the unknown and the fear of being judged. And so I don't think it, it's fair to judge our folks from the west side of town. I also don't think it's fair to judge what happened at the Gregory School meeting, suggesting that that's who those people are, right? I know many of you, and I know many who were at that meeting. It was a meeting of frustration. The meeting we held with our residents a few weeks ago was a meeting of frustration. So the commonality, again, is that frustration. So if we can get past that and take the name Newtown away and stop using the Gregory School meeting and stop using the fairgrounds meetings, how do we begin to talk, right? Because when we can begin to talk about things like this, what we'll know is that this development is 49 units, 22 of which are home ownership. When we started having conversations, I heard the community say, and, and you know, we have a lot of the documentation, that said if you just got it down below 50 or at 50, we would support it. We're at 49. 22 of them with, tw with 22 home ownership units, one of the prior phases had eight. At the end of the day, when these get sold off to folks who live there who have to learn how to be good neighbors and will be good neighbors, because I know they want to be, they will have an investment in this neighborhood and there will only be 27 rental units on this site. So what's it look like? 
Um, these are conceptual drawings, of course, and, and this is how all these real estate development deals go. And if we could back up to January and have not been hell-bent on getting a grant application as a community, and I take ownership for a good part of that, um, you would have seen something more like this than what was in that Choice Neighborhoods application. The Choice Neighborhoods application actually had a concept drawing because at that time all we were saying is we wanted to work to improve education, housing, health, and jobs. And the $28.5 million, $28 million that was being asked for in that was really fixed by the local investment. We couldn't peak at $30 million, which is where I was hoping for. But only about $16 million of it was actually being focused on housing. And that money was going to provide for the redevelopment within the fairgrounds neighborhood, because that's going to be the hardest one to finance. So we would have seen something that looked more like this because we would have had the opportunity to have more community meetings, but we were railing for a deadline on a grant. And if we could go back and undo anything, it would be that. When we did the Jane Addams development, we also looked at um, street level renderings, and this is one that we're proposing for this site. So. You may ask, what's in this? You, you saw it out there. We purposely didn't label it because I want to have discussion about it here in a little bit. Um, we're looking at townhomes, and uh, they're on both sides of the site here. In the middle, there's these small areas that, that people may be wondering what they are. Um, one of the things I think we've done incredibly well, and Katie is here from Angelic Organics, is to really advance our urban uh, farm and urban agriculture program and last year we produced more than a couple thousand pounds of food to feed residents who live on our site because if they're able to eat healthier their health outcomes are better if they're able to not spend that money to go out and buy food but can grow it in their own neighborhood then they're able to put that money towards something else right so what we wound up doing is creating interior pockets of gardens and and green space right and so these boxes around are going to be proposed areas of storage for garden tools. This is all going to be dependent on when we get to the point of a building permit, right? So the other night, um, it was asked of Shishita, who is one of our young ladies who lives at Fairgrounds, even though you qualify, do you know whether or not you're going to move to Newtown? And she said no. And this is a situation much like that. I can't tell her she's going to because we don't have approval to build anything yet. And I won't lie to somebody because, frankly, our residents have been lied to by years, or have been lied to for years, and many times by even our own agency. And that's unacceptable to me. I will not do that. So I can't tell her whether she's going to move here or not until I know whether we can build it or not. But I also can't tell you that this is exactly what it's going to look like until we go through the process of getting approvals. But this is what we are proposing it look like. And this is what we are proposing it look like because we've had conversations in the community about design, about density. We've had discussions. And this is what we believe along the east side. Um, keep in mind on the other side of those trees are single family units. We want to make sure that our for sale product moves over and if we do good real estate development you know those practices are that you leverage your barriers and your transitions right so we go from single family neighborhood to low density multifamily home ownership neighborhood to multifamily and on the north we have commercial and on the south we have residential and we work to blend those uses of real estate together so people feel comfortable in their environment so i know andre had planned more for the real estate part um, I know that there's probably some things that we can't get into um, that perhaps our aldermen have questions on, but we will have meetings coming up about that and share those in, in committee, I'm sure. But um, we had a great deal of unanswered questions in the last round, and I want to make sure we get those and any new questions. So if you had new questions after you were out in the lobby, please make sure you're bringing those um, forward, and we'll make sure we get them up there. Um, but we're actually going to try a different approach and just sit down and talk. Um, because I move around too much, and I think that uh, that makes people nervous. So, Mark, you lost the mic. Oh, here, why don't we grab this one for the moment, and we'll replace it when we bring folks up. So, at this point, we're going to spend about 15 minutes um, answering questions. 
Um, if it takes longer, are you okay with us staying longer to answer the questions? Okay, so we will. After that, um, to give fairness, we wanted to make sure that like a typical government meeting, because at the end of the day, unfortunately, that's our structure, um, we're gonna give the, the two minute opportunity for everybody to speak. So we'll return the mic at that point. Can everybody hear me? I've dropped things, I've lost things, it's, you know, heck of a day. Um, let, me, let me, you know, one of the things, I want, I want to start off with a question of my own. One of the things that um, I think we discovered when we were, were, when we met last week is that people on both sides of this issue, and there are probably more than two sides, but people on, uh, on both sides of this issue are really driven by some pretty deeply held values, and I'm, I'm curious as to what values you, as a, as a, as a human being, bring to, bring to the work you do. Sure. Um, actually, one of the folks, I, I guess, on, um, on break had asked me, or, or had stated, this is probably one of the hardest things you've ever done, right? And the answer is no, it really isn't. Um, and I, I think if I go back into my value system, it's based on my experiences, right? And my growth and, and what my family put in me uh, as values. And I did come from a family. Um, my mom was 16 when I was born. They were unwed. Um, my dad was 17. They, uh, they were married. I guess they were married a week before I was born. So I guess they were wed at, uh, at that time or married. Um, it was hard. And, and so growing up in poverty, they, neither of them had their high school um, diploma. Um, my dad went back in, got his GED, my mother as well. And it was difficult the first number of years. And um, I remember, you know, moving from Chicago where my dad eventually did become successful because of the folks he surrounded himself with. Himself with. Um, he owned a couple of gas stations. They were on the south side of Chicago. And um, we're the only white folks in that neighborhood. And so being a minority, in a sense, in the neighborhood, I sometimes know what it feels like to be the outcast. But the interesting thing is there were people who cared and were honest and, and honest with their feelings and, and sharing, um, which for me set a lot of tone, I think, for where I am right now. There were also folks who were very dangerous and caused a lot of problems. And ultimately, because of that, my dad had to close the gas stations. We moved out of town to Wisconsin. Um, to a town of 300 people in the, cent in the center of the state. So culture shock. Um, and now it was different again, right? Now I'm in a farm community where um, they hated folks from the city and they had a name for us. I'm sure we all know as Illinoisans what Wisconsin folks call us. It starts with an F and ends in a B. Um, and that was interesting. Um, I was hated more in Wisconsin than I was in the south side of Chicago. And we looked the same. So those types of experiences drove my values, and my values are, um, I believe we all have the opportunity or should have the opportunity to succeed in life, and I also believe that we all don't always have equal opportunities. And that while we think in this day and age the opportunities are equal, they're absolutely not if you're unable to be in an environment that, that breeds success or encourages success but has a whole lot of chaos. Okay. All right. I want to, uh, let's turn to some of the audience questions here. Um, you know, you, you talked about <coughs> uh, crime stats mm -hmm. and, and uh, whether or not crime does follow, does not, what have you. Um, <coughs> you know, one, one question here so it makes the point, statistics are misleading. Um, when data is used out of context, it can deliver predictable information, it, 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 and I think the point is it can, it can uh, uh, prove what we want it to prove. Um, you know, how do you dismiss or how do you, how do you respond to studies that, that uh, say crime will increase uh, around a development like this? So 
Um, it's actually a great question. How many folks participated in the library's discussion on the ecology of democracy? Anybody? Cindy did. We were at the same meeting the other night. And it's interesting, um, in talking through that book, it was written by Na uh, Dave Matthews, but not the singer, um, just another guy with the same name. And, uh, and in it, he talks about how do you engage the community in democracy. And um, in asking the community, and this was for, for your benefit, Mark, this was actually by a newspaper. They asked the community in, this, uh, in, an, in another city, you know, what do you want in public dialogue? And they said, well, we want facts. And then they went on to say, um, you know, well, what do facts look like? And um, they said, well, we don't want statistics because we know statistics can be manipulated. And I, I agree that they can be. Um, I'm sure, and, and you know, probably are, are not going to, um, I guess you'll be surprised I may say this, I could probably go out and find statistics and data to, to really back up any claim I'm making, right? But with statistics, we do have to look at the source of that research, the source of the study, and is there consistency over time in scientific method and, and findings. Um, because at the end of the day, with the internet the way it is, you can find any amount of crap out there you want. And um, ultimately, you will um, find some who will believe that. And so I think it's the quality of the source and, and documentation over time. Okay. Um, here's a, a question about uh, uh, money and the, the investment in, involved. Uh, proposed for Newtown. Uh, let's assume that the average investment at Newtown is a $150,000 per unit. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it seem like a better solution to raise the homes around Lewis Lemon, thereby improving the neighborhood and improving the tax base? In addition, couldn't sweat equity be utilized to gain a greater sense of ownership? This seems like a more cost-effective uh, solution. Um, alternatively, abandoning the area around Lewis Lemon will create greater greater blight. So, how do you how do you uh, how do you respond to the question about cost? What's most cost effective and the use of sweat sweat equity? Sure. Um, actually, in in you know maybe the question came in before the uh, most recent part of the did, presentation, yeah. but um, we actually have to be balanced in our approach. So, we do not want to leave the neighborhood and leave it with pockets of, of you know, blight and um, disinvestment. That's really what's been going on for decades, right? The, the value continues to come down. We have to instigate um, or initiate investment. And I think if we look at what's been happening in, in the neighborhood, um, that's, hap that, that's really going on, but not in the housing market. Right now there in Rockford is really no housing market. So how do we best serve that? And I do believe it's by putting homes back into the neighborhood. I do believe it comes from a couple of approaches. And we've had this conversation with Gorman, and if Andre was sitting here right, you know, right next to me, I would say it again, and he would agree with it. I don't believe that RHA and or Gorman should be the only housing game in town. And we have worked for a couple of years to ensure other providers of housing and, and not-for-profit partners, for-profit partners, will have an opportunity to build in the, in the neighborhood of Ellis Heights. Um, because we do need to elevate. And then I, I, I talk about, and you, know, you probably may think I'm as crazy as others do, but I always have this what-if question, right? What if we're really successful with everything we're trying to do in Ellis Heights. What if gentrification starts to occur and the folks who have lived there for years now can no longer live there because it's too expensive for them to live there? We could probably all right now shake our heads and say, well, that's probably never possible. But there are neighborhoods throughout the nation that that's happened to and it's happened in Chicago. So how are we going to protect and preserve the rights of folks who are currently there who do own homes, the few that do own homes, those that grew up in the neighborhood want to stay in the neighborhood but want better opportunity, yet, you know, whether it's because of retirement or, or, or current position, need that affordability, right? So we've, um, we've got some proposals out there for land trusts um, to ensure affordability over time. Because I, I think as a community, if we're not planning that far ahead with the, you know, with the outcome, 
then we're not really doing justice to either neighborhood, east or west of town. Okay. Um, I, I think you've addressed some of this uh, when you talked about Gorman's whereabouts today, but, uh, but uh, I, and I know this is, I, I heard chatter about this in the, during the break. Um, we keep hearing the word dialogue used by Gorman representatives. Um, there's been absolutely no dialogue from Gorman and company. We, the residents, have never seen Gary Gorman or Andre Blakely to have this dialogue. Where's Gorman today? We have ideas and answers, but have been shut out of any dialogue. Uh, there has been a absolutely no dialogue regarding safety for the children, traffic, the Illinois Watershed Act, security, etc. When will we have a dialogue with Gorman? Okay, well, one, you know, on behalf of them, I do apologize that they're not here today. Um, I want to make sure we don't miss that last screen that was up there, but this is the current question. Um, you know, one of the things that, that becomes a challenge, and again, if we could go back to January and, and get that grant opportunity off the table, um, we had worked on that from April of 14 through December of 14 uh, with folks in the community, including a lot of, of municipal staff. If we could get rid of that, there would have been a different path of dialogue, right? But unfortunately, we can't go back. And what happens is much like, unfortunately, with our aldermen today, um, because there is a bureaucratic system and there's the potential for litigation, when litigation is tossed on the table, lips become closed, right? Because you, you, have, to, you have to be ready for that. And I, I think that it would have been much better if, if we didn't get to that point so quickly of, of anger, frustration, and hate, and um, accusation, because I think the dialogue would have been significantly different. Going forward, these types of, of um, exchanges, we want to continue. I think the one thing that, um, for those who have been down the real estate development path before know, it, it, you know, aligns with the comment I said about Shishida and, and making a promise to her. You don't normally come out of the box to the community to begin to build consensus until you have your facts. So some of those facts are, did we have the right path? And you know, we know that through the plans that that, that authority is there. Was the zoning correct? Yes, the zoning was correct on multiple pieces of property we looked at. Could you get the financing? And ultimately, you know, that was determined we could. Could you then bring people together to talk about design and concept and, and play within those rules to create a great development? And by the time we got to that, the, the frustration had risen so high, it, it really squelched those discussions. Um, to be but quite you're, honest, you're saying you will get Gorman here to we have similar yeah. conversations, yep. um, yeah. and and as soon as practically yeah. possible. Okay. And and there have been folks telling us we shouldn't have this discussion today, and um, and I don't agree with that. I mean, we've been listening to that for months, and I wish months ago we would have said, you know what, too bad. Let let's have the discussion. The people want the discussion. Okay. Um, let, let me follow up. You mentioned litigation, mm -hmm. the potential for litigation. Is there something, anything? What, what, are you, what are you talking about there? Well, you know, think back to the, the letter we received from HUD as a housing authority. Um, we were told when we withdrew the application that um, we potentially as an agency violated federal fair housing. And, you know, so, so folks wonder where that is and, and why that's important. Um, probably would be worthy of explaining where, where HUD is on it. So they look at... Um, our public housing plan, right? And in our public housing plan, which we create on an annual basis, we said that we were gonna do certain things. We said that we were gonna um, demolish fairgrounds, we were gonna rebuild it in multiple phases, that we were gonna do it in a manner that's consistent with the consolidated plan. Our public housing plan is signed off um, you know, by, the, by the administration, particularly through the mayor's office, that it's consistent with the consolidated plan. And so as far as HUD's concerned, for the past um, five years I've been there, this has happened every year. So then they go back and look at the consolidated plan, which is vetted through a public process, and they ask, um, is it in the consolidated plan? And if we look at the consolidated plan, um, one of the slides, if folks want to see it, we can back up, 
it says that in the consolidated plan, um, Rockford Housing Authority and Winnebago County Housing Authority will continue to deconcentrate poverty and public housing, moving developments as needed to opportunity areas. So this is considered an opportunity area by two methods. Um, one is let, let me let me interrupt and just in, a, ask this: um, What's the is there a time frame? Is there a deadline attached to that? Well, now there is, yeah. Okay. Um, and and we were working towards having you know the time frame and and we keep pushing it out there, but we're getting to the point where we we can't push out any longer. Um, we're looking at you know the early part of the year, and we're at a point now. It all depends on you know, the approval process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so anyway, just the HUD piece, they, sorry, they, they then see the approval in the consolidated plan. They also see it in the deconcentration plan that we did as a community that says that these are the opportunity areas. And there are several within our city um, under the deconcentration plan. But then when you get to the state's plan, there are only, you know, at the time there were only three, now there's four. But, but these are the guiding documents, and so they're saying, well, hold it. If you had local authority, if you had local um, you know, approval under the consolidated plan, under your public housing plan, under the deconcentration plan, and under a HUD Sustainable Communities plan that all went through 70 plus co uh, public meetings, why aren't you doing it, especially when the zoning is in place and the townhome ordinance that you're proposing is supported? You know, you have to, and in essence, um, I don't do things because we have to, I wanna do them because they're right, and I absolutely believe what we're doing is right. And so I know that may rub some the wrong way, but it's a statement I have to make because I do show up every day to advocate for those we serve. Okay. Um, question about uh, the impact on the current four Fairgrounds neighborhood. Um, are you not abandoning the neighborhood by moving residents from fairgrounds? Uh, and then uh, secondarily, uh, do not HUD rules and the executive order allow for spending on improvements, public transport, transit, schools, employment opportunities, et cetera, in the neighborhood surrounding public housing? And I guess I, guess I, would, I would expand it a little bit, um, uh, just, a, just a little bit. Do the people who live in fairgrounds really want to move from that neighborhood? Some do and some don't. Okay. And, and so we know that um, roughly 40% of them, when we went through the, the meetings, in fact, we had a couple of meetings a few weeks back on, on RAD and, and giving a residence update. Um, those two meetings had more than 100 households represented. And what we found is there's still a consistent 40% who want to move out of the neighborhood. And not all of them want to live in single family homes, not all of them want to live in town homes, but those are the two top priorities. And, and single family homes absolutely by many is their desire. Um, there was another part of that question yeah, I don't want to miss. Um, I, mean, I mean, you're concerned about uh, abandoning the neighborhood uh, by moving residents from fairgrounds and then uh, do, do HUD rules and the executive order allow for spending on improvements you know, uh, in the neighborhood? So um, as long as we have a balanced approach to development where we're working to put about 50% of our work into areas of opportunity and 50% of the work into neighborhoods where there is an active redevelopment strategy. And in Ellis Heights, that's the Choice Neighborhoods Plan. So we could do half of our work in the Ellis Heights neighborhood and half, in our, half of our work throughout the community. Um, and so the answer about abandoning the neighborhood, absolutely not, because we need to work to reinvest in the neighborhood. And if you look, um, for those who, who didn't participate in the choice plan, the number one, things, uh, number one thing folks wanted in that neighborhood was a grocery store. And so we're thankful that we're able to get a, a grocery store built in the neighborhood, um, a $4 million grocery store that you know, not only provided now healthy access and eliminated a 30 year lack of, of fresh groceries in the neighborhood, fresh um, produce and, and meat in the neighborhood and groceries, um, it's an opportunity for jobs, right? And if we look at the jobs data, um, the amount of businesses within the Ellis Heights footprint is a challenge, right? Um, at the end of the day, the solution to poverty is to provide a job and access to income and, and asset growth. So we absolutely must continue to look there and. Um, we're hopeful and, uh, and remain 
I'm excited to be able to announce soon a, a potential industrial use in the Ellis Heights neighborhood uh, that has the possibility to provide up to 80 jobs within the neighborhood. And by industrial use, mean, you mean a some kind of manufacturing company Correct. coming there? Okay. Yep. Um, question about who, who gets in and out um, uh, of uh, fairgrounds in Newtown. Um, you know, uh, will the, will the standards for admission, if you will, be the same at Newtown as at fairgrounds? And 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 you know, uh, secondarily, yeah, how how will you prevent? How would you prevent um, Newtown from becoming a new fairgrounds? So um, admission standards actually are going to be different on the private side than public housing. But consistency you're going to find is still the access um, or the uh, uh, application process around criminal background and, um, and monies owed others. Those are, those are key in any affordable housing development. Um, for those that you know, come on to the property, what we find, um, and you know, I use the Jane Adams development as an example, um, when we tore down the old Jane Adams and built a new, we could say, well, that's an infill, right? The neighborhood's still different than the Newtown area, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, but the quality of the development, the management of the development, the access to that development, and I know we have um, someone here who lives in the neighborhood, is different. It, it, it provides a different um, feel, which encourages people to act differently. And when you put folks in a respectful environment as opposed to a horrible environment, they do act differently. They have a level of respect for that environment. They don't want to lose that. And ultimately, with proper management um, and design, you see a significant change. And, and this is all over the country, folks. This is in, in neighborhoods of all different kinds. When you have that, the ultimate outcome is different. And um, you know, we, uh, we've seen that development there now for three years. Have there been an occasional issue? Absolutely, again, like any other um, neighborhood. But the fact that they get stepped in and, res you know, step in, resolve, change. Um, I think we've now had, our legal staff is here, um, three years, four evictions, perhaps-ish, from, um, from the Jane Adams development, as opposed to, you know, more than 100 a year that we do at RHA. Let me let me tie this question back to um, you know one I think that was asked earlier and, and a little bit of your presentation. Um, you, you talk about uh, the services that are going to be provided, uh, hooking people up with employment, education, healthcare, things like that. Um, it almost sounds like uh, you are talking about having case managers working with, with yes. your residents. Talk about how that's, or, or coaches, talk about how that's going to work. Sure. Um, well, depending on what income bracket you're in, some folks call them case managers, other folks nowadays call them life coaches. Um, and somewhere in the middle you have mentors, right? I think for those of us who have grown up, um, there was always that person who came into your life and made a difference, right? Um, we hope to find that for most of our folks through a mentorship agreement or a relationship, but at the end of the day, some folks need um, that case management piece, and that is, um, how are we going to help you find success, right? How are we gonna connect you uh, to the bureaucracy of government structure and system? Um, I know I, I was uh, speaking to one of our, our teachers who's here today who has made a commitment to her kids, she works at Auburn, that she's gonna take the public transportation system for 30 days. Um, she's discovered it takes her two hours to get from her job to pick up her kids to get back to where she needs to be for home. And we don't think about that because we think about our experiences. I can hop in a car and do that same trip in you know, probably 10 to 15 minutes in Rockford. It's costly to be poor. It's costly to not have access to opportunity. And when I say costly, it's costly of time and energy of the family, but also to us as taxpayers, right? So through case management, if we can align those systems, get folks access to those opportunities, ultimately they have more time, energy, um, to spend on solutions that help them get out of poverty and ultimately reduce the burden on themselves as well as our, our public access system, public support system. Okay. Um, here's a question that gets back, it really touches again to, on the issue of, of uh, 
dialogue and and, and public uh, public input. Um, you know, to what extent did the neighborhood outrage and pushback from the summer cause you to revise the proposal? You know, we, we moved from what seventy units to sixty-ish now to forty-nine. Um, and uh, uh, progressively the quality of life for future residents improved. So apparently there were plans A, B, and C. Um, additional pushback will inevitably create plan D, which will be better for residents. How, how do you respond to that? Sure, um, good question. So when we originally started and we started looking at the property, um, we knew it could do up to 90 units, right? Under a, a special use permit. But there was no way we would propose 90 units. I just can't do that. There, there's got to be a balance in density and design and what you could deliver for service on a site. And so if we were looking at it solely from a profit motive, we'd have just thrown 90 units on it and, and um, move forward. The other option um, is not the townhome development, right? For those not familiar with zoning ordinances, there's two methodologies for that site that could be done. One is multifamily and the other is townhome. Townhome is what I showed um, in the pictures, it's what's out there. Multifamily means we just put one big building up. And so if we were driven by profit, honest to God folks, we'd put one big building up. It's the cheapest way to build it. It's, it's you know, the most effective way to operate it. But I won't do that. We, we will not do that. That is not an acceptable means for housing folks. Um, there is that respectful environment that you need in your neighborhood and we need to deliver for you as well as our residents. And so the townhome approach uh, is what we agreed to. And so we went from actually um, initial drawings of 70 down to 65. And we did those through a public process where there were, I, I believe, five uh, meetings with a, a design firm to talk about design and, and that was done through the, the public side. There were things that came out of those meetings that um, created hostilities and I think um, we have to be very sensitive about how we talk about things and you know just as an example I'm getting dressed this morning do I wear a suit do I wear a shirt do I wear a t-shirt that says I am Rockford will I be considered hostile in any of those you know in any of the, in any of that attire um, so I chose not the t-shirt, not the suit, but the words we should have chosen through some of the vendors um, related to on-street parking, um, a uh, amphitheater. There, there was an area in the initial design that, that sat about 20 people to sit outside and enjoy you know, what we want to make in the, in the creek area there is, is a rain garden um, that is a, a great use of, of um, stormwater runoff areas to improve um, the environment. But the word amphitheater, I mean, you think about that, what do you know as an amphitheater? Well, there's a Sears one down on, on I-90, and the vision of hundreds of people sitting out for perhaps a U2 concert came to people's minds, and the reality was it was a reflection Did you say area. you're bringing U2 to Rockford? Did I hear no, that? No, we wouldn't do that. I don't, I don't have that. Um, ability, but that's that's what people thought, right? So we have to be very sensitive about the words that were chosen. So the amphitheater has been removed, and, and there are community gardens and reflection area. Um, the units have now gone down to 49, and um, much more spread out. We have designed, or Gorman has designed, based on the community input, the parking to be on site right in front of the units, which there was a piece of that that was already there. But we've been able to not rely on on-street parking along Newtown because it will all be within the development. And so um, there will not be any parking on the Newtown Drive area. Um, although best practice from a safe street perspective and a complete streets perspective would suggest that wide street for your neighborhood is too wide and too fast. So we, we probably, just so you know, will help um, with some discussion about how do you better utilize that street um, in a more controlled environment well, I, for safety I, for everybody. Okay, I, um, because the, one of the questions here, and I've, I'm combining a couple things to take advantage of what you just said. What, what sort of, uh, okay, so no on-street parking. Um, what, what about traffic control? You know, kids who walk to school, things like that. Sure, so um, we've actually gone out and looked at, for those who go to Gregory, who will go to Gregory, um, 
the route which I, I showed um, would actually go you know, out of the development, cross at a crosswalk um, to another crosswalk, and uh, we will make sure that, like all other children in the neighborhood, they're, they're provided the same equal access to that sidewalk that would come around um, and get the kids over to Carroll Court at Gregory. But then there are other schools that they'll be taking the bus to, and there will be a, a bus stop for the school bus at the site. And then, um, you know, we're also looking at one of the one of the things the original designers put out there was, you know, can we help get sidewalks out to State Street with a crosswalk? Um, I think as neighbors, we should all do that. You should have had that already, right? I mean, that, that to me is not the most uh, friendly approach for pedestrian traffic, but the reality is we as a community have never really looked at pedestrian traffic in the right way. So we have a lot of areas throughout the community that this needs to be fixed and we'll help with this okay. one. Um, here's a question about the age of affordable housing units. Um, can you talk about what's the RHA average versus the state and national average? Sure. So most of our product is, uh, is, 19, is late 1960s. And so it's going to be somewhere between 67 and, uh, and 72 is when most of our stuff was built. We did do about uh, 30, sec uh, excuse me, 30 scattered sites in the 80s. And so um, if I could go back, I'd, I'd you know, reflect to the RHA that never should have done that. Um, has anybody seen these units? Uh, they look like garages. And you can drive by and go, oh, yeah, that's where those folks live because um, they look like a box with just a couple windows and they did nothing for, for the neighborhood. We can't do that to our neighborhoods or the people who live there. So our stock is incredibly old. Most of the public housing stock in the nation is of the same age. Um, both here and abroad, we did uh, millions of units in that time frame. And other communities, other countries are looking at how do we renovate that. And actually, I do sit on an international committee that's looking at that. I don't think we should renovate all of our products because they never were built right from the beginning. So why put, you know, unfortunately, another way to say this, lipstick on a pig, or, or continue to make mistakes that we knew were mistakes um, 40 years ago. So the best practice is the low income housing tax credit structure of affordable housing is um, various functions of mixed income. There is no silver bullet, unfortunately. Um, I've heard a lot of reference to um, Forest Glen being 60-40. Um, and I should tell you, we, folks, we actually were looking at buying that, had a, a contract that was imminent. Um, and we had a, a very large disagreement with the former owner um, who suggested when he found out it was the housing authority that we could go from 13 million to 20 million and he'd show us how to do that and I won't waste government money that way. Well, that was very money. generous of him, wasn't <laughs> it, with our yeah. tax dollars? But, but, but that's how we work and so the 60-40 split at that development is one of many that work and there are some developments like we're proposing that have a predominant affordable factor between 50 and 60 percent of area median income and they work. They work again because of the design, the management, the location, and the access to opportunities. Uh, now, I am trying to get through all these questions. Some of them are similar, so I'm, I'm doing a little bit of uh, strategic uh, uh, con con condensing of them. On scattered site, a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, does it provide a higher quality of life uh, for the residents? And does it also is it also provide greater value for the for or, 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 what does it do for for uh, the value for the taxpayer? Sure. Um, well, it uh, for some does provide a higher quality of life. Uh, for some, perhaps not so much, and that's why um, we believe the best approach for providing scattered site housing is folks need to learn to grow into that opportunity, and, and we need to provide them that opportunity for growth. Um, you know, we. Uh, we get a lot of calls at the housing authority and, and we've gotten them from our aldermen um, because you've called them and said, you know, there's this crappy house on our block that folks aren't taking care of it. And, you know, I want RHA to address it. But at the end of the day, we find it's not our house, nor is it a Section 8 house. And sometimes 13% um, of the time, it's actually owned by the person who's living in it. And they're just a bad neighbor. And so that there is no way 
to train everybody to be a good neighbor. Um, I know that, uh, thankful, the Rolling Green uh, Neighborhood Association has come up with a platform that actually we want to help replicate and, and help train folks to be good neighbors. So if... Can you, what are some of the planks in that platform? I'm curious. So some of the best approaches for, you know, home, home ownership or, or rental of single family homes is, you know, from the curb, are you taking care of the unit, right? Are you taking care of the home? Can somebody drive by and look at your tall grass and unkept weeds and, you know, poor quality, you know, paint or, or exterior uh, maintenance and look at that and say, while well, you're not contributing to the quality of the neighborhood, we have that all over our city, and, and we need to do a heck of a lot better job of that. I know the city's pushing that from a um, codes standpoint. We're pushing it from a housing quality standards inspection standpoint on our Section 8 units, and um, I'd like to actually see us unify those inspections, because if we're doing housing quality and they're doing codes, we could actually put that together. If anybody hears from the Landlord Association, I'm sure you'll kill me when you get out in the lobby for saying that, but I absolutely believe we need to do that. We must do that. Um, along, uh, you mentioned the landlords. How, how, uh, how can local landlords get involved in this discussion? Well, we held a, a landlords uh, convening this p uh, past week, I believe it was. Um, the days are all running together now. But uh, we had a number of folks from our Section 8 landlord base who came in, and uh, we talked about you know, how we could best implement um, better housing quality standards, how we address things such as um, fair housing, how um, we really work to improve the quality of, of the Section 8 program. And um, the other part of that is how do we actually then reach to neighborhoods of opportunity, you know, the, the higher income neighborhoods to provide a Section 8 home in those neighborhoods, um, because that is actually what helps us advance and get people out of poverty. So those discussions are happening, but, but there's not enough. And so, um, again, I, I know the Rolling Green Association has invited me over. The, um, uh, Cindy, I don't recall the name of the association we met with up on Rockton at the, I think it was a Lutheran church. Thank you. Um, I know that there's been discussion with the West Gateway Coalition. You know, how do we address these issues with, with landlords and, um, and I don't want anybody to think I don't believe there are good landlords in the community because we have some, some amazing landlords here. But we have some not so good ones and they don't even live in our town and yet we let this condition um, fester. So we have to keep having discussion like this. Um, here's a question uh, asking you to address the stereotypes regarding affordable housing and then uh, and asking, um, is the Gorman project proposed for here similar to housing environments in New Orleans? So um, some of the newer product, yes, um, if we're talking housing environment, um, because it's based off the same platform and, and the same um, value system of, of valuing the folks who live there as well as the real estate collectively in a, um, a relationship that allows both to succeed, right? Um, if we're utilizing our, our public dollars as best as we can, we need to uphold and maintain our properties, these, these new properties, to contribute to um, the growth of that neighborhood as well as the growth of the people who live there. Um, you can see the, the question up there. I want to make sure I answered all of it. So the stereotypes. Um, you know, I, I, I can't help but think of a social media exchange last night um, where I had, you know, our, our, our folks had posted the, uh, a video about the Jane Addams development and um, somebody posted, I'd appreciate not seeing, and I'm paraphrasing, but not seeing those folks sitting out on their patio when I drive by not doing anything. What's unknown to that individual is we have folks who work the night shift. We have folks who are retired because it's a, a senior facility, um, senior and disabled. And um, we also have folks who you know, are disabled and unable to work you know, in the way that we believe they should. Um, and by that, I mean the, the commenter. And so um, there are a lot of stereotypes and there are a lot of judgments made just because of um, now there's an attention given to that site because we're saying, you know, look at it, look at the quality. And so from, some folks are actually looking at it and judging the folks who live there again, which over the last few years we haven't really had 
but because it is in the spotlight, that, that stereotype is there. What, what, what percentage of um, uh, RHA residents do hold jobs? Do you know? So we have to look at the, the data about the resident. That's a good question. So we're about 60% senior and disabled. So of the 1,900 public housing units we have, um, about 60% uh, about of them currently, 58 and change, are senior and disabled. Some of those seniors do work, but not many. Um, most of them, uh, most of our, our senior and disabled folks are either on SSI or SSDI, Social Security income, Social Security disability income. Um, but on the other side of that, the other 40% of our folks, uh, more than 20, I just looked at this yesterday, I think it's more than 24% currently are children. It's why kindergarten is important to me. It's why um, third grade reading levels are important. It's why college graduation is important. It's why high school graduation is important to us. So that, that middle part are our families, and of those, about 30% currently are working. Um, we went from a few years back having about a 4.3% annual income for these, uh, excuse me, $4.3 million annual income collectively for these folks up to now. Um, as of yesterday, close to $5.3 million in annual income. And folks can look at that and say, well, they're poor. Well, absolutely they are. That's why they live with us, right? Um, we were designed and created to help low-income residents find a path out of poverty. Public housing over years became a warehouse. We are no longer that agency. Okay. Um, this is really the last question, and then I'm going to uh, ask for some audience uh, uh, participation here, um, starting with uh, the person who, who gave me the map and wants to, wants to uh, ask a question based on that. Um, but, but this is really the final question. The minister in his prayer asked that we work together, but so far it is only RHA's way for the neighborhood. How about working with the neighborhood by only putting in four to six or uh, f uh, 46 families or four to six families and, th and three duplexes? And I think w that really gets at what, what is the range of the possible? Sure. Well, I'm sure many are going to disagree with this, so if you do, I, have, you know, I, I don't know how else to say it. Um, we started with more than 70, we, we settled on 70, we brought it down to 65, we brought it down to 65 with eight home ownership. Um, we never intended for it to be a single building under multifamily, but to fit um, as townhomes within the, develop, uh, within the development, because that's what's respectful to the neighborhood and replicates the, the fabric of the neighborhood. Um, we're now down to 49, and again, of those 22 are home ownership units. So while we may not feel listened to, I can assure you our changes are because of what you've said. And so we have assembled now um, what is our, our final option, and, and here's why. Um, we have to deliver replacement housing. Because as a community, we have said for decades, and, and I want you to think about this, um, and, and I see some folks shaking their head, as a community, and, and whether we've participated in the public process or not, um, our government that I admit I play a part in um, has locally, through its consolidated plan, said we are going to continue to deconcentrate poverty and deconcentrate race, um, that we were going to provide economic opportunity for folks and we've taken money from the federal government for decades to do that. But at the same time, we have not delivered, right? We have not broken that cycle. So they're asking, what'd you do with our money? And you know, I, I think they have the right to ask. Um, they're asking us, what are you going to do about it? Because you were created by this local institution, the city of Rockford, you know, 50, 60 years ago, to address this. And, and all we see you doing is perpetuating this, this situation. So you need to make these improvements. So when the rules are out there and the townhome ordinance on that site is allowed and the multifamily zoning on that site is allowed and the unit mix says we can build with up to 50 and we're below the 50 and then our public housing plan says we need to do it which met you know, city approval and the consolidated plan, which met city approval, said we need to do it. And the state housing plan, which met local approval, said we need to do it. If we don't do it, folks, this community is going to find itself 
back in that fair housing litigation that was threatened earlier. And I think if we go back and look at the people who care lawsuit for our schools, who won, right? At the end of the day, nobody really won. Our, our attorneys made some money, no offense to our attorneys in, in the audience, but attorneys made some money on that deal and our community really has not progressed a heck of a lot since. And so we need to make that progress and we need to, as a community, reach out and figure out how we do it together. So while you may want input in less than 49, we can't go less than 49. If you want input on how that money should be spent, we certainly can look at a lot of the operations of the site because that's not a closed door. We can look at some of the aesthetics still because that's not a closed door. We can look at how do we become a better neighbor, not only on this site, but throughout the whole community. Um, you know, we had a strategic planning process that lasted a year. We're willing to have those conversations because I'll admit to you folks, we have a long way to improve as a housing authority, but the best structure we have done is to look at some of the privatization we've done through a public-private partnership. And, um, and I want to continue to have those discussions. All right, well, thank you. I want to open this up to, to the audience now. Um, but first, I want, Paulina, are you? But, you, 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 had, you handed me the map and asked uh, that we per let you personally explain your question. So let me give this to Ron and. OK. I think I might see what you're asking, but I want to make sure I do know. Okay. If we can please put the map of phase one, the second map of phase one. Right here on this street, this is new town condominiums is where we live. Right. Here is a former post office, and right there, the other street is Javelin. And there is already housing projects right there in Javelin. And also, if we go new town, and this is Diane Drive, and right there is Orchard. When you come at the end of Orchard, there is Midway, and there is housing right mm -hmm. there too. Now, there are people from the housing there and from here. They have caused a lot of problems in our neighborhood. To the point that statistically, in six months, we had 187 crime um, mm -hmm. in our area, okay? It's a lot less than what it is in fairgrounds, but that is how it is. Now, if you're going to bring this project here, do you remember, or you realize, midway, here, and here. And some of the things, is, some of the things is going constantly to the elementary school. The police is there all the time. We are not against helping people that are in poverty. We are against the crime, and that is why sure. almost 3,000 of us signed the signatures, and we who are the adjacent, right here at the condominiums, the people in this Diane Drive in Orsha that is facing your land that you possess now, all of us, we do not want this project because of the crime. Mm -hmm. And so it looks to us that if there is housing already in Midway, put housing here in Javelin, are we going to become the fairgrounds of the city? Is that what you're trying to do here? Please, no offense, but that is what it seems to us. Sure. And we have pleaded and pleaded, we do not want the project, please do not build here, do not bring this here. It is because of the crime, we don't want it but nobody has listened to us. We had signed, we had pleaded, and it seems to me that all the time we hear how you're going to build it and about if it's appropriate to build it, but no one has addressed how we feel. Hmm. Now, you mentioned that the Jane Adams project, if the neighborhood is really, really bad and you build a project, of course it's going to bring better to the neighborhood. But if a neighborhood is good and you bring a project like this with a lot of crime, the neighborhood will go down and already is going down okay. just by having those houses. So I do want to So, so yeah. the question is, 
Maybe. Are yes. you trying to do to make us in here another fairgrounds? That no, is the question. And, and I do want to. I was hoping this thing had a pointer on it, so for what you said, we could point things out. Uh, because wonderful question about location. No, we are not trying to create another fairgrounds, and actually, this platform we're talking about will not do that. So. The, the map I have, um, and happy to share it out you know, from here, there is a duplex unit on Javelin that is ours, right? It, it's a, a home with, with two living units in it. And um, what she's talking about Midway is actually called Midvale. And that's 30 units of disabled supportive living. And of those 30 units, I know that 26 of those folks are actually restricted to a wheelchair. So but I'm not talking about that. Okay. The the people you can go and ask the handicapped people how they are attacked all the time, but the houses that you have right there. Okay. So what so what I would like to do because I don't have those statistics handy, but I, I will get the crime statistics for you. I can show you that um, mm -hmm. our Midvale folks aren't creating issues. Now, I do know that we have some folks at Midvale who are restricted to their unit who have indeed had calls made. And I think what we need to look at is calls for service and then ultimately look at the cause of that cause for service, or call for service. So many times, and it's an unfortunate fact, but it is what it is and it is what we're created to do, some families just don't want some folks in their family anymore and we take care of them. But at the same time, what we find is they do actually care about them. And so when they don't hear from one of their, their you know, relatives for quite some time, they'll call the police and say, will you do a welfare check on my sister or my aunt? And the police show up, knock on the door to make sure they're alive. And so if we look at the number one calls for service for Midvale, those are our police calls for Midvale. So there is Sorry, an area. We, I, we know the people at, at Midvale because we carry some of them mm -hmm. to our church. And we know they are wonderful people, but they are being victims of mm -hmm. what is going on right there on the other street. Okay, so. They are being victims. So who so is making the, them victims? The people, the people who live in the handicap in the mental hospital, they have never created problems. But really, the young people who lives on the, the other street already. They are the ones who rob, do graffiti, attack the people who are in the, in the wheelchairs, and go to the school also to create problems there. The police is there all the time in Gregory School, especially on weekends. We see them from our unit. Okay, so the, the thing I guess I'm gonna ask then is, if it's not the folks from Midvale where there's 30 units, it's folks preying on the folks from Midvale. One, I want to make sure we're aware of that because we need to take care of that. I won't let anybody abuse our senior and our disabled. But they must then be coming from the neighborhood, right? Which as a neighborhood, this is something that I've thrown out to um, some members who, who were here and, and remain here. The most successful neighborhoods are those with a neighborhood association, right? I'm, I'm thankful that some folks are stepping up and trying to organize and be participatory um, in, in a neighborhood discussion. Because our aldermen will tell you, and, and I can tell you from my previous experience, that the only time we see this type of engagement, when crime elevates and people are taken advantage of, people step forward and say, I don't want it in my neighborhood anymore. But then as soon as the crime goes down, they go away and they, they leave the table and no longer have communication. And that's not acceptable. So one of the things we want to do, and, and I can tell you the, the folks um, from the Orchid neighborhood with Jane Adams, they didn't want us there in the beginning either. They didn't want us to build there. But I do know now that through this development, our community room there is the site where they host their monthly association meetings. And the alderman hosts their ward meeting there on occasion so that we can get folks to interact in the development and solve the community issues that are through the whole community. We will offer that, that site, that community room, to the neighborhood. And I still stand by the previous offer to the neighborhood. If you live in this neighborhood, the housing authority had agreed to put money on the table so that you could form a neighborhood association. 
Now, we could do it for you, but I don't want there to be any allegation of bias that we set it up a certain way. So we will provide that money for a legal startup cost to form an association, and when the deal is, is, is complete, our community room can be used for those type of gatherings because I don't want that in any neighborhood. And, and those are folks that we need to address just as much as you do. And if we're going to be neighbors in this neighborhood, let's do that together. I'm, I'm getting uh, told that we need, we need to begin to wrap up here. So we have time for maybe what time is it? two more comments here. Yeah. I really have a statement that I'd like to read because I've been t attending all of these sessions. And I want to thank you for this information session. Why don't we address the elephant in the room? The concern is really who is moving where. The design model of Fairgrounds and Brewington Oaks was a failure from day one. Research overwhelmingly tells us that mixed income, a steady housing model with access to services is the best. We are all the same. Desire an excellent education model, safety, and beautiful residential environments. Let's collaborate to work to provide viable housing for all citizens, regardless of economic status or ethnicity. I think we need to get below that level and really address what is going on here. So, um, like I said, I'm getting really frustrated because we don't really address that. It's who's moving where. And you can dress it up like any other, like you said earlier, dress it up, but a pig with lipstick is still a pig. Thank you. Thank you. One more. Scott? Yes, I'm Mary Jo Powers, and I live in the Newtown neighborhood. And um, we've lived there for 48 years. We've never had our house broken into. We have lots of ethnicity in our neighborhood. I am in favor of this project, and I will do whatever it takes to help you with it. Thank you. Thank and Scott you. was called on, so yes, Scott. Um, let's make sure we get Scott, and I think maybe over here, too. Two. Um, I want to go back to your last statement before we opened up for questions about all of the mandates that have come from various levels of our government, um, approvals of plans from our city and our county and our state and the federal government. And you seem to continue to go back to that saying, you, we have to do this because everybody says we have to. Well, we ha what we have to do is we have to redevelop our public housing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we have to do South Newtown. And that's where I have a problem is because you guys used a very shortened, secretive process to establish this particular project and now you're saying we have to do it because everybody else says we have to. We have to do redevelopment. We don't have to do this. Okay. And I appreciate that. Uh, I guess a couple of things. Um, it wasn't secretive. And, and I know we're going to disagree on that. I, I know we're going to disagree on that. Okay. But RHA hosts meetings on a monthly basis that are all open to the public. The city council meets weekly. And, you know, through that process, the consolidated plan, the 2020 plan, zoning, all of that. You're hanging your head, uh, you're hanging your hat on all that, the public meetings. Larry Morrissey last week said decisions were made behind closed doors in a shortened time frame to get this in place. Well, I have to disagree with you. What I heard him say wasn't that decisions were made in closed doors. And um, to be quite frank, I've washed the mud and bus tracks off my back for that statement because I do think a lot of public meetings were held. Were they enough? No. Are we needing to continue this? Absolutely. And we will continue these types of meetings, but at the end of the day, it is difficult for any community to accept change such as this, and we're going to have to figure out how we come together to address that change. And I don't come places to tell people what they want to hear. I, I say what needs to be said. Um, I was told by some I should start throwing people under the bus. I won't do that. That's not how I work. And so while I want to truly respect everybody's opinion, 
we have a path that we are moving towards. And can the balance of path be discussed? Absolutely. Can we find solutions going forward that continue to benefit the east side of town, the west side of town, because our whole town benefits from that? Absolutely. Is it going to be ugly sometimes? Probably, because this process is like making sausage. Um, it's not. It's not fun. It's not exciting. But at the end of the day, I know that when we provide high quality places for people to live and we make improvements in our neighborhood and people come together and they honestly care about each other, our whole community is better off for it. And this type of discussion um, that's referred to as NIMBYism, and I, I get why, um, is happening all over the nation right now because of decisions made around fair housing. So we're not that unusual as a community. So I don't want us to hate ourselves for having this approach. But these are the ugly discussions we have to get beyond if we're going to progress. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Our host, we need to turn out. We really do need to turn the room back to our hosts. Um, I'd like I, to say what, something real quick. Sure. I'm back on that. I'm Dennis. I'm Dennis, by the way, and I live in Newtown. And if you look at that plat up there, I came here this morning and I went from my condo up to State Street. The road between the new planned income housing and the post office. Single lane, no plowing. Where are you going to put the snow and when that's full over there? There's no place to put it. Where are you going to put the parking for the people that come who are friends of the people that live there? And that's fine, but there's very insufficient parking. Not, you've got enough for the people who live there, but what if their friends come for the weekend? They will park on Newtown. It says no parking, but they will park there because there's no place else for them to park. Uh, do you um, do you live in the condos over here? Yes. Okay. I drove through there yesterday when I was out taking photos. And actually, we're going to have more parking internally on our site than you have in your condominium. So guests, et cetera, will park in the site, not on Newtown. And believe me, if they do park on Newtown, like some contractors did recently, I encourage you to call the police and have their cars towed. I'll call the police and have their cars towed if that happens. But that's not going to um, because inside there is ample parking and because the parking is contained inside and the roadways in there are private roadways there is ample room for snow to be pushed inside the development not into the street of Newtown. It sure doesn't look like it by that map right. up there. It probably doesn't appear that way but if we put an elevation of your condo development and this you're going to find there's actually much more common space than you have and, and I can assure you of that. And I also heard we keep hearing there's like 6.3 acres or 6.2 acres there if you take back all the setbacks, the trees on the back side, the floodplain by uh, Rockford Auto Glass there, um, there's actually less than six acres there. Mm -hmm. So but, you're saying we can put 49 units on six acres, but if there's only four and a half acres really, after all the setbacks and everything, then you're putting too many units in that area. Well, if you look at it that way, we have to look at all development that way. And all development does have setbacks, has the need to uh, take care of stormwater treatment, has the need for roadways, all that. So again, it's very similar in, in, in density and design um, to others in the neighborhood. And, and that's one of the comparisons. But I do, um, I do want us to really think about the, the function of the space, right? in the design of the space. And I want us to think about that as we go forward for discussion. So as we go through continued discussion about how's the stormwater going to be handled or how are we going to address snow removal and how are we going to address all these other things that I know people have questions about, let's make sure that those are on that board out there because we would like to make sure that we take care of those long before a shovel is in the ground um, because those are things we need to solve. And I'm betting most folks who created development in your neighborhood didn't have this kind of discussion at that time, but we want to be good neighbors and do that. Right. So, Well, number one, the street's not wide enough. If you've got the uh, police substation there, and then you've got the condos or the housing there, that street's not wide enough to handle access and egress, ingress and egress into that, such, into that new, a new Actually, land. by design, it's overly wide. To be to just from an engineering standpoint, I know I know again. Drive down where, that street today. I, I know. I urge you to do that. I, I understand, and it's the same in other areas, and so that's why I don't really want to debate that. 
But I, what I do want to do, and I know we do need to be good hosts. We said that we would be out of this room by 11.30 because they need to get set up for church later, um, church services. I am more than happy to have a conversation One last in thing. the lobby. According to that plant up there, yep. it's an artist rendering. But on that corner, yep. um, that's a blind spot. Yep. If and that's truly what's going to be there, you're going to have accidents every day because you come around that corner, people drive up there 50, 60 miles an hour right. speeding. And we and need we've to address even had a that couple too, right? Go straight into one of the condos there. R Ron, did I hear you say you would maybe hang out in the lobby for a little I bit? I will. Why don't, why, don't we, why don't we plan on that? And if anybody has additional comments, questions for Ron, he'll be, he'll be available out there. Thank you very much for coming. I think this has been a valuable, valuable experience for all. Ron, thank you. No problem. Um, can I ask one favor? I've drank a lot of water and coffee up here. I need to use that restroom before we have a conversation. So please, if I run by you, um, I will come back. Okay, thanks.